Um, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Thank you, Angelica, for that uh, lovely intro. Thank you, Nigel and Juliet, for organizing this, and, and hello. So, um, yes, the question was very interesting. You know, why is diversity and inclusiveness crucial in business today? I work in this every day. I don't always stop to think, why is it crucial? I know it's crucial. I feel it's crucial. So how do I talk about why it's crucial? Um, so I'll talk about it from the, the dual perspectives that I have. Um, I am an academic and a researcher. I am a visiting fellow at the Cranfield um, Gender Leadership and Inclusion Center. We're actively researching, we're interviewing and, and talking to uh, senior leaders in FTSE 100 and FTSE 250 organizations currently to understand more about um, inclusion there. So there's a lot of research going on, lots of data that I look at, um, but I'm also a practitioner. I am a consultant and um, am senior managing consultant and an executive coach with Delta Alpha Psi. Uh, Delta Alpha Psi is a boutique consultancy focusing on inclusion. So there's, there's theory, research, and there's a lot of practical everyday stuff. So why is it crucial? When I look at all of that, and I try to sort of bring it down to a, a nine minute discussion, um, there are three reasons. The, the, the three reasons are one, it's a demanded, two, it's required, and third, it's impactful. So there, these are the three reasons why it's crucial. It's, demand, it's being demanded by the stakeholders of whatever organization you work with, small or large, um, be it clients, be it current employees, future employees. So the world's looking, looking at this. Um, I wake up every morning and scan the press. I look at HBR, Financial Times, law.com, lawyer.com, whatever you look at, it comes up very, very often diversity and inclusion. There is scrutiny, organizations are being looked at, leaders are being looked at, and there's constant analysis. So it's demanded. The heat is on. Those of us who've been working for a long, long time welcome that. Yeah, it's time. It's really time. And for us, from a business perspective, from a consultancy perspective, we've never had more demand uh, than, we, than we have now. So th th that's one reason. It's demanded. You have to do it. It isn't really a choice anymore. The second reason why diversity and inclusive is important from my perspective, it's required. It's required, required for retention and progression of the best talent. If we think we are uh, retaining best talent without looking at it from an inclusive lens, we are, you know, we're failing ourselves. We are not actually looking at the largest talent pool. Um, if I look at the, um, so I just want to come back to the demanded piece. Actually, I wanted to, I, I, there was something, I had a quote from the, um, the 100, 170 general counsels had written in 2019 to law firms. So just want to bring it to the legal sector. And they had said this in their letter. Um, do, do many have, many of you read or heard about that, that letter that was penned? No. All right. So yeah, one person. Um, in 2019, 170 general counsels wrote a letter to law firms requesting more attention to diversity inclusion. And that signaled the urgency. So clients are looking at it. A lot of the law firms I work with, uh, lawyers I work with say that they're actually sent away from their clients if they don't send a pitch team that is diverse. So what the, the, the letter said was, and I will quote here, we are disappointed to see that many law firms continue to promote partner classes that in no way reflect the demographic composition of entering associate classes. Partnership classes remain largely male and largely white. So 2019 clients were saying this. Moving on to the second reason, it's not only being demanded by your clients, it's required. According to the uh, Solicitor's Regulation Authority and various other sources, women make up over 50% of law firm uh, associates and over three quarters, over 70% of the business professions and support staff are women. How many, what's the percentage of women in partnership? Yeah, thirty percent. So, so it's around thirty percent, and it's it, it you know it varies by size of organization. On top of this, what um, one of the other pieces of you know information that's important is black lawyers are four times as likely to leave uh, law firms than other ethnicities, and this attrition happens at trainee level, at three years qualified, seven years qual qualified. So throughout the life cycle um, of, of an employee. 
attrition is much higher for a certain group. And I'm very interested in that. Why is that? And my work as an executive coach um, is really working. I, I focus on um, minority ethnic talent. I work a lot with black women. I work with black women in asset management. I'm working um, on a project to, to have hundred black professors. There are only something like 30 black professors in the, in the entire UK right now. Um, so in, in we don't have enough data in the law firms. I don't know exactly how many black female partners there are, but at, but the black lawyers black lawyers are leaving. And at one point there were less than 10 black lawyers with over 10 years of experience. So there's attrition. So it is required. Inclusion is required. Now, let me tell you a little more about this attrition. Why is this attrition? What's happening? So in the last 10 years, I have coached over 75 women and minority uh, people, minor, minority ethnic um, lawyers. And over and over again, uh, the discussion that comes up in executive coaching is I have to make a choice. I have to make a trade-off. I have to understand this tension between what is important to me personally and what is required of me professionally. How can I be authentic and how can I conform to what is required here? How can I balance what I need for my personal life and what's required of me here? And this question and this tension is beyond it, sometimes it's untenable. Even as a coach, I listen to this and I'm thinking, I don't know what to do here. I don't know how to work with this. The issues are clearly structural. And I hope in the young baby, I've forgotten her name by the time Emily, Emily grows up, we won't be asking those questions and she won't be facing any of those tensions. So as, as a coach, I do know that these, these are the tensions and, and sometimes it's untenable. Um, I spoke to a female lawyer today who said, yeah, I just, I went on a career break and I decided not to go back. I started my own business. I did something else. And I hear that story over and over again. So that's where the talent is going. One of my coaches um, said, well, if I ask for flexible working, I will signal a lack of ambition. I know I will be sidelined. I will not be on the partner track. Another one of my coaches um, talked about going into a partner's office and he, he looks up to, at, to her with a big smile and says, I think we're ready. I think we're going to put you up for partnership. You're going on the slate very soon. And she was thrilled. And then he said, just one thing, don't go and get pregnant anytime soon. She happened to be pregnant in her early, early stages of pregnancy at the moment. Yeah, so you've all reacted. I, I still have that physical reaction when I think of it. If this wasn't that long ago. This happens, right? So where, what's happening? Why is there? Why are we having attrition? Why are we losing talent? Another one of my coaches was uh, sent on a secondment to an office in Europe, um, uh, outside, uh, outside the UK, from the UK to an office in Europe. Um, she had a special uh, subject matter expertise. She's a black woman. She arrived there, her, her subject matter expertise was required for something that the, the office was working on. Uh, the senior partner took her aside and said, look, we're, great. we're glad you're here. We really wanna work with you. We want your knowledge, but I want you to know that there are people in this office who will struggle to, to listen to you, who will struggle of you being here. They will not feel comfortable being led by someone like you. At that very moment for her, she said, it became salient. It became obvious. I am the only person of color. I am a black woman in an office that's never worked with a black woman. And, and at the, in, in our coaching sessions, you know, she started to, her anger was there. And she said, why do I have to carry the burden of their biases? Why could this partner not speak to those people who have this issue? Why was it mine? Was it, I just want you to know I'm doing you a favor. I'm letting you know. I guess in a way, knowing reality is always better than not knowing it. But the inclusion would have meant partner one doesn't really devalue someone because they're, they're pregnant. Partner two doesn't push the burden on the individual to, to, to manage the tension of someone else's biases, which are misplaced. Um, and, and, and that's the sort of thing that, that drives people away. I'm probably way over time, so I'll, I'll rush it along. Um, so these stories of bullying and microaggressions really are, are at the source of the problem, um, as well as organizational housework. Women get a lot of the non-promotable tasks. I, I sometimes have three-way sessions, the partner, the, the female colleague, and the coach, which is me. And we, and we often get admission from the partner that, yeah, actually, a lot of the stuff I've asked this person to do isn't the stuff that, uh, that is counted 
when we look at uh, promotion uh, potential, but we do need it. We need someone to mentor the groups. We need someone to work with the juniors. We need someone to write that documentation, but it isn't the sexy stuff. It isn't the visibility stuff. So that's the other reason. Look at work allocation, you know, look at microaggressions, look at bullying, look at the underlying mindset around race, around gender. So the third reason, so those are the requirements, uh, why, why it's required in order to have a good workplace. But finally, inclusion is impactful. Inclusion makes a difference. Inclusion and inclusive partners who behave differently than the partners I've described to you, inclusive leaders who, who can take in, who can work with difference will actually create a better working place, work, workplace for all. Uh, in fact, and what the, the what research shows us that with inclusion, uh, we have uh, improved team performance, we have better decision making, we're more likely to arrive at the accurate solution, greater innovation, more retention, um, and and more um, pro fair progression. So there's enough reasons out there. Uh, inclusion is a leadership imperative. It is being demanded. It's being required, and it does have an impact. It but it does require something. It requires the commitment. It requires accountability for change, and it requires courage to critically question the current behaviors and practices. So I hope uh, that that sort of answers the question as best I can. Thank you very much, and I'll hand it back to you, Angelica. Thank you, Manjuri. I mean, we know that this is happening, but when you hear the stats, it's quite alarming, isn't it? Um, we have another heavyweight in the room um, who could... Take on Tyson Fury, if she is. Uh, Dana Dennis-Smith, come on down, please. We'd like to hear from you, CEO of Obelisk Support, which provides flexible legal solutions. And we're going to talk about that in more detail in a sec, but have a seat. I know, I know I'm not wearing the right. I know, you came prepared, okay. Um, one of the things I love about my job is that I get to meet loads of people with a story. And I think when you find out about people's story, you find out what drives them, what motivates them. And I think we spoke for half an hour, well, we said 10 minutes, we'll have a quick chat, 10 minutes, you know, we had things to do. And then we were on the phone for half an hour. And your story is incredible. And I think we should go to the start so people sort of understand who you are um, and what life was like when you were young. Yeah. Um, so I, I grew up, um, hi everyone, <laughs> I grew up um, in communism in Romania, in Transylvania, and uh, I didn't particularly like the lack of freedom and the fact that my life was very directed. Um, it was kind of, well, in a good way, actually, now I with hindsight here, um, I was going to be some kind of engineer, technical person. In fact, um, when communism collapsed, I was um, studying to become an electrician. So I had the whole life uh, mapped out for me. I had quite a distrust of lawyers. We had a few um, kind of incidents where justice was not made um, for my family. And um, they seemed to just talk a lot of gibberish, really, <laughs> and uh, to be very, very aligned to the political regime. So I kind of, you know, came to law with, I guess, a very different view of what the world um, beyond freedom can represent for your life. But before that, you were a journalist. OK, well, yeah. So and once the regime collapsed um, and I was a teenager, I um, shelved everybody's plans of my medical career and decided to make my own plan, which was to become a journalist. I think because because of the kind of very controlled environment and lack of freedoms of any type that I grew up in as a child, it was very important to me to go up against authority and challenge it. And journalism was a way of questioning why are people accepting this kind of behaviors? Why are politicians not being held to account? So my choice of journalism was a kind of rebellion, I guess, um, and also driven by curiosity. And also you said it was it gave you the freedom to deliver without being controlled. That's what you liked about it. And then when you moved into law, it was almost like you were back in that straitjacket. Well, I, I wouldn't like to compare it quite you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> to say, you know, magic circle of prices equals fill the gap. <laughs> but it did, feel, uh, it did feel like a lot of the qualities that I could bring weren't being seen. And also that the environment was very, very um, inflexible and 
you know, certain things have to be done in a certain way. Obviously, I get quality, excellence, and all of those standards and everything, but it seemed to go beyond your agency. You seem to have no right to say I'm sleepy. <laughs> I like to, you know, sleep in after 72 hours in the office and that kind of stuff. So um, other people controlled, if you like, very basic human instincts, you know, like when do you go home and... Uh, you know, do you need to sleep under the desk and that kind of stuff? And I guess that brought back memories of being controlled. So when you, I mean, we talked about you had to do the long hours um, and people would say you have to stay later and you challenged that, didn't you? Well, I think I had the benefit of wisdom and being a little bit older than other people. So I guess I felt, you know, I qualify when I was, uh, maybe I, did I qualify or maybe I started? I don't even remember. I, I was already in my early 30s by the time I kind of hit the legal kind of landscape. And um, I just didn't need to put up with it, to be honest. And I could see, you know, new graduates crying, being bullied and harassed and all of, you know, <laughs> you've all been there probably. Yeah, some um, people are nodding here <laughs> going, yeah. And so I felt for them really strongly that it wasn't right what was happening, but equally that I didn't need, you know, it wasn't all or nothing. There must be another way. And there's always a bigger world out there. And I knew about it because as journalists, you do come across a lot of real life stories and real problems and people that have no voice and you give it to them by writing a story about them. So for me, I guess I didn't go in with this kind of pressure of if I don't succeed here, that means I'm a failure everywhere else. I felt there must be another thing that I can do. I use my education, my qualities, whatever I've learned and pick myself up and do something different. And I guess that's what I did. (laughs) And that's what you did. 2008, you set up an emerging markets business. Um, But after a couple of years, you thought there was no scale to it. So you had vision. You wanted something big of yourself. And then in 2010, you set up Obelisk. I did. So I went away. I had, because of my communist background, I didn't really have an understanding of market economics. I mean, I did from the books, but, you know, we didn't really have any business, Um, no private enterprise. None of that was allowed. Right. So my kind of family didn't have any, you know, entrepreneurial. I don't know, like you hear these guys who say, well, my grandfather was running a factory and then this and that. None of that. Okay, my parents were just workers. And um, so I didn't have any sense of can I be entrepreneurial? Do I have money to be entrepreneurial? I just thought, well, I have a journalism background and I qualified as a lawyer and I must be able to bring them together. And that's when I found that this company that was operating in the compliance space and political risk, that's what I knew. That was my kind of geographical area and my knowledge. But it it became very clear that people were fixated on me. I, you know, what I had to say, what my report would say, or would Argentina default and things like that, even about countries I had no idea. And I kept saying, it's not my expertise, but like, we'd like it to be your expertise. You know how it is when you're in-house, right? As a a second, and they kind of think that you are a lawyer that does everything. Like, no, no, that's a technical area. Let me (laughs) explain. And like, no, 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 but you must be. And I'm like, no, no, I don't think it works like that. So it became very clear that I could not, unless I could clone myself, it didn't really have scalability. And that wasn't the kind of business. It's called the kind of entrepreneur that's a technical entrepreneur. And it wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to become, you know, to create a business where I was doing the business work as opposed to the technical work. And so when I went to India on a trip with that business, um, I discovered this trend for outsourcing offshore which was big, big because of Lehman Brothers and nobody had any budget anymore. So they came out with this idea of offshoring to cheaper labor, basically. And um, it just, I had this kind of light bulb moment. Why aren't we sending the work to people that want to work from home? (laughs) And um, I guess all my memories from the law firm world flooded into my brain. I was like, yes, I don't remember seeing lots of women partners. Where are the women? And all of these questions suddenly I realized when I looked underneath that we were seeing a massive talent drain. And then I got outraged and pretty angry. <laughs> so, and I thought this is not acceptable because um, I know what it's like to fight for your education, to fight for your freedom, to fight to be in the room, right? And um, how can we allow this to happen in a country that I rated, a country where I felt, you know, we should be advanced, progressive and all of that stuff. And yet the women were just all leaving the room and 
anyway, so I created, I guess, a business that was supposed to be a room for them where they could thrive, continue to work, um, not worry about having to go to all those business development meetings where they have to find their own work, you know, all these kind of things that were barriers in the pri private practice. If you want to be a partner, do you have clients? Are you a rainmaker? All these labels. And I thought, what about if somebody just likes doing a contract? Can I provide that work for them and take away all the hassle, all the worry and allow them to go and pick up the kids, drop off the kids, not explain themselves to anybody, just allow them to be whatever they train to be, i.e. lawyers in our case. So I came back straight away and I just went into a flurry. And then, and then, and then <laughs> you set up the business and you marketed it with, you had 500 pounds and you went, you went into it, but that year you had a life-changing moment as well. Well, I, it, well, it was starting to be the life-changing life moment because um, she only arrived the following year. Um, so and she's I, in the room? She is in the room. She had an exam. How did the exam go? <laughs> Very well. Superb. Thank you for being here. Um, yeah, so I, you know, I figured I had, I, I, I did all the things that people say to you, you know, business plan, all of that stuff, maybe investment. So I, you know, went pregnant to ask a few people and they're like, yeah, but you'll quit, you know, because you've not been a mother before. I was like, no win here. So very much the game was zero sum and you were in or out. There was no in between. And I wasn't um, thinking that's the right future to create, I guess. Um, and uh, it wasn't like the fastest accelerated um you know growth to the business as you can imagine with a baby in your hands and no childcare, no money to pay for the childcare, nobody wanting to invest but how did people react that you you know you were setting up this business for flexibility then you've got a child of your own was it you know were you met with positivity or negativity well people didn't know much because you know we were still in the world of pre-covid where kids were still not being talked about quite as openly i mean when you were pregnant and you had meetings people you know somebody i remember he was um a, a banking gc and i was so excited to meet him and he said should you be out on the street you know it's really cold outside and look you're very pregnant i was like you know, being pregnant is not illness. I will manage. I'm out because I can, but I like your business, please. <laughs> <laughs> he did congratulate me on all the achievements of about five years later, but forgot to give me the business. So I did remember <laughs> the important element of our conversation. <laughs> but anyway, I was grateful that he had spotted, you know, we were creating something where, you know, I spent most of my early years actually with the mothers and the parents hearing about how desperate they were for my opportunity. And I needed to create this for them to make sure they had the options. But I wouldn't say it was easy because um, there were also, I guess they're called prejudice, or all sorts of kind of things that you encounter, you know, first of all, because you show it, then because you're kind of so exhausted and you kind of go into a bit of a negative space because you're tired and all of that. So you're thinking, will I ever make it out of this hole? Is this a good idea? Full stop, you question yourself. And then you think, well, what have you got to lose? You've got to accelerate. So as kind of the child grew, the business grew, and then it all kind of stabilized, you know, school age, that kind of stuff. There's more stability in the day, more income in the business. So you can actually wrap yourself with some support around. Um, and actually, my husband was great because he helped me win the first bit of major work with Goldman Sachs. Mm. <laughs> so we, um, I was desperate to meet them. Somebody introduced me to this particular lady. And uh, there was one lady who was doing a couple of hours every now and then for me to be able to go to meetings. And uh, she got the time wrong and she was about two hours away from my house. And... Um, she said, I can't be there for your meeting. I'm afraid I'm in Sutton or some far away place. And I said, well, that's not great. So I called my husband. I said, I don't know what you're doing, but you leaving, whatever you're doing, you're turning up and you're looking after the baby because I'm not giving up Goldman Sachs. And he did. We didn't say one word when he arrived. I opened the door. I was already ready. And he opened the door and we didn't speak a word. And I exited and he entered and we, that was it. And then I came back and I said, we won it. So I couldn't have actually won anything if he hadn't been there for me to enable that handover of responsibility to be able to make it. So it's been, I mean, I, you know, the first four years were difficult and I remember never sleeping and it was worse than law firms, <laughs> you know? Um, I was always on a kind of night shift um, working away, but, um, Nothing was more rewarding than getting emails. And I remember this particular lady who came back and had a week's work 
actually doing some due diligence in a London um, a client. And she said, finally, I have my own money and I'm going to get my kids presents for Christmas from what I earned. I felt like crying. <laughs> so yeah. it was such an amazing thing. I was like, you haven't yet been paid it. <laughs> so oh. don't spend it. Like <laughs> cash flow <laughs> management, you see, I was born oh. for it. I was like, please don't be careful. <laughs> you haven't had it all yet. <laughs> Got the invoice and all of that. <laughs> So, look, it's grown and grown and you've done amazing things for women um, who are so grateful for the, allowing them not to have that guilt, but still be amazing and brilliant at their jobs. Um, I want to talk about the first 100 years um, because you want to celebrate female lawyers who've been gone and sort of paved the way for other other lawyers. So tell us how that started, because you saw a picture in a magazine yeah, well, yes. Yeah. So um, my husband's a lawyer, so he um, always got lots of stuff because he was still, in a way, more connected to traditional practice than me. So he was getting lots of kind of, those days, still physical mail. And um, I was reading it, he was getting it, and I was, you know, actually consuming it. <laughs> I guess journalism, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so I saw this photograph with one woman in the middle from 1982 and like 60 men, one woman uh, partner. And I thought, wow, this could explain a lot of things, including the absence of women as I was in practice. So when I um, looked into it uh, deeper, I discovered that women were barred from becoming lawyers until 1919. And in fact, they needed to change the law because they were considered not persons by law. And I thought, wow, we've got to do this, you know, big celebration. I figured at the time that the centenary was coming up ahead in 2019. So that's how um, I started the campaign. It was a way of really celebrating women and making a big song and dance about how much they've achieved, but also putting it on a timeline and giving it a framework because a lot of women had no idea about this year, how important it was. Um, and then we basically started filming our legal pioneers from today because I discovered that most of the breakthroughs were in our lifetime. <laughs> that woman in the middle, you know, and a lot of people after her. So we needed to create a library of stories, you know, provide role models for the current generation, really in inform and educate the legal market about the role of women. So they don't see us as absent, but they see us as cent cent you know, central to the story. A little bit like that woman, but the story was all about the guys, but I was gonna focus on her and really on women like her and encourage them to talk about their life and work together. So no avoiding, I have children, no avoiding of my parents. Start from the beginning, a bit like what you did today, you know, tell me who your parents are and then you end up with their achievement. Because otherwise somebody said, you know, whenever I watch one of your films, everybody's a baroness, that's not very diverse. And I said, well, that's a very interesting start from the beginning and you find out they didn't start a baroness and they have very different parts to their success. And that's the point of the project. So it celebrated 100 years of women in law from the act that allowed them to apply to be admitted. And this year we're celebrating actually the first generation of qualified women. Um, the first were the barristers um, in May and then the first four solicitors in December. Fantastic. Listen, time is short. Oh, yes, yes. I feel like I'm on a television set. Wrap it up. Wrap it up. Um, the one thing I do want to say, though, what you said to me about value, um, and I think this is really, really important. You said that if someone doesn't treat you with dignity, walk away. Um, quickly, one last question. Future for women in law, what would you love to see? <sighs> one million questions. I know, one minute, one minute. <laughs> I think we need to see true equality across the board. And I, I know it sounds like a really boring word and, you know, we it's overused almost, but I like to see women equally paid, equally promoted, but equally visible. And not to suffer from, if you like, we have so few women that we see that we burn them out because they are overexposed. And I like them to kind of be in the limelight, but in the right kind of light. Donna, thank you so much. You took less than 60 seconds. Thank you. Give her a round of applause. You're now going to hand over to Juliet. You're, you're going with me. Let's come on, come on, come on. Can I welcome my panelists to the floor? Yeah, I'll do it. There we go. Sorry, thank you. Right, this time is tight. I'm going to get Sorry, going straight away. I can start with Bola. Um, Bola is Head of Inclusion and Corporate Responsibility at Osborne Clark. 
She's worked across a range of industries, but has spent most of her career developing responsible business programs in financial services. She made the jump across to the legal sector in 2020, where she has spearheaded Osborne Clark's DNI and CSR strategies, seeing the firm jump significantly in both social mobility and LGBTQ plus employer indices. Driving progress on female progression remains one of her key priorities. And in an industry flush with female talent, the need for change is clear. So Bola, what are firms actually doing to try and change the culture, and particularly around tackling flexible working? Thanks, Julia. Oh, God. God, I love these things. Um, yeah, I, I have to admit, I've been really surprised actually jumping into, into the legal industry because I just look around and 60% of your female lawyers, if you're just looking at the lawyer side, are women. So how is it that you... The, the, the tables are turned at the top and it's, it's taken me quite a while. But what's been really interesting about the kind of work that happens and not all of it is effective, but the kinds of things that um, firms tend to do, I think the way I, do, the way I look at it, it, it's categorized around three kind of areas. One is around the self, the other is around the business and the third is, seems to be around clients. So around the self, you, you see a lot of programs which are around female development. There's a lot of mentoring. There's a lot of sponsorship. It's essentially really focused on the individual. The other really interesting piece of work there, which I do think has been quite effective, is around demystification. So in some firms, one of the things they're trying to do is change people's perception of what it means to get to partnership um, and the idea that actually you've got a cookie cutter partnership. Um, so really trying to help people understand what partnership means in that particular context has been quite impactful in terms of encouraging women to kind of stay and stick it out. Um, and then when we think about the culture, education's a huge part of it because there are a lot of people who are still really ignorant about the reality of being a woman in law. So um, I had just had a conversation today and I was talking about some of the things that we're doing and someone said, but, but isn't that unfair? You know? And I was just like, well, what do you mean? She said, well, you're disadvantaging those other people. And I said, well, the first thing you have to understand is that you've made an assumption that everyone is starting from a level playing field. So people don't understand that the playing field is currently not level, that the culture actually favors particular groups. And I think in law in particular, where there's this real sense of equality and the need for equality, people seem to believe that we live in a pure meritocracy and that everyone's starting from the same point of view. So you have to do something around education and really helping people understand that we're not all starting from the same level. The other thing is we've also got kind of got to fig, you know, figure out how we change society because, you know, everyone, you don't walk through the door, get the magic wash and suddenly, you know, you, you, you see the world in a different way. Socially, I mean, Angela Rayner, anyone? I mean, the, 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 the society, our mentality is not necessarily geared towards true equality and an understanding of that. And then the third um, area where we see lots of uh, work with with um, with with legal with law companies is uh, with clients because the other thing that you get is well you know we've got to be there for the clients so if you talk about things like flexibility people are like well clients 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 and so I think client collaboration is something that's really uh, one obviously there is some client demand now which I think is really really helpful. Um, and that demand is starting to drive more client collaboration. So, well, well, if we are working in a highly transactional, you know, environment where you do need to be there at all hours for, for this limited period of time, then, you know, how can you work with a client to make it work for, for those people, not just women who have other responsibilities outside the office. So I think if you think about those three buckets, there's quite a lot happening, but as I said, it's not all particularly effective. Interesting. Am I going to be joined by you? Yes, I'm going to come in because I've seen Angelica do it now and I don't think it's that hard. <laughs> right? Sorry, couldn't help myself. I'm going to bring An Andrea into it now, please, Andrea. Um, Andrea here on the end is head of the Pinsent Mason's Belfast office and leads both the Belfast property team and the UK retail property team. Divorced mother of two, Andrea is a passionate and active advocate of diversity and inclusion with a particular emphasis on the advancement of women in business. And she sits on the Pinsent Mason's Global Inclusion Board as their gender representative. Andrea heads the Pinsent Mason's Project Sky Initiative, a program aimed at achieving an improved gender balance in the firm's partnership and senior leadership team. Andrea, thank you. And thank you for flying over from Belfast today. Oh, it's awesome. Thank you for inviting me. Um, um, it all looks easy until you get up here, I'd have to say. <laughs> Angelica's is worth every penny. <laughs> before, before the pandemic, I didn't need these. <laughs> 
<laughs> you can ask your question. Yes, I'm going to hit you with a double question if that's okay. okay. That's fine. Okay, so um, you're in the partnership of Pinsons. You're a lawyer, so I want yes. to go into what has your own career taught you taught you about the culture of law firms and how's it changed, and then secondly, what can women do to help themselves? in terms of career progression in the okay. law firm? Um, well, first of all, just to give you a bit of context, I have been in the law for quite a long time. So um, I trained in London, um, worked for a big London law firm, um, and I then moved back to Northern Ireland on the basis that I couldn't figure out how you would have this high-powered law career, which, you know, when you've been through law school and everything else, everyone, that's what they want. Um, and how I could do that and have a family and have some sort of a life. So I moved back. It was never really an intended move, but I moved back to Belfast. Um, now, if you think sometimes that cultures are far behind, uh, wonderful place as it is, it was like moving back 50 years. Uh, there had never been a female partner in the firm that I joined. Um, women didn't wear trousers. Um, it's quite a long time ago, but it, it really is um, going back to that sort of stage. So the culture has changed, completely changed. There is a long way to go. But some of the things that I did learn, um, and this was a great lesson for me, was not to always judge a situation as you see it. So I assumed I was going back to this very old fashioned firm. Um, I've been very lucky in London to have really good male mentors and I will always be grateful for that. There are some fantastic people out there who are really good at mentoring women, um, male, female, but just really good and give up their time. And I was equally lucky when I went back um, to Northern Ireland because what I found was that this glass ceiling that I assumed existed, I thought that I would be doing um, a certain type of conveyancing for the rest of my career. Um, actually, it wasn't the case. Um, there may not have been a, a female partner there. Um, I did become the first female partner. It, it took a few years, um, but they were terribly supportive. Um, so I think sometimes, and it leads on to the, to the second question I was asked, um, there are huge challenges. Um, we have it in our firm, we have it in lots of firms. I think lots of the firms have made a lot of inroads into the challenges about getting proper gender balance um, within their industries. I think it's something that certainly I'm very lucky to be part of an organisation that feels very passionate about it. But I think you also have to remember that Within us, there is always a bit of unconscious bias that you don't actually know is there. Um, so don't always assume that the people who are going to hold you back are the people who look as if they are old fashioned or they're not diverse in some way. I see the problem much more now in terms of racial equality. We you know, we have a good gender balance in law firms. Um, as Bola said, the difficulty is gender balance with senior positions. We're getting closer to that. It's still going to take some time. I think the racial piece and ethnic minorities is much, much harder. Um, it would be lovely to see lots of women on boards who are not white women um, and just have a mix generally of people. But I think you also have to, we all have to take responsibility and accept the fact that we have to be role models or try to be role models. We have to challenge things, but we also have to be supportive of other women, of other people. Um, we have to admit that life may look as if it's great when you get to a certain stage. It's not. It's always messy. Um, my life doesn't go smoothly. Everyone's life doesn't go smoothly. So those are the things that I have learned. And to try and allow for the fact that people are different and they will come at their careers in different ways. But we shouldn't lose as many women from law that we do currently. Thanks, Emily. Um, I'm going to pass the microphone along to Sally. Um, Sally's been, and thank you for coming, Sally. It's brilliant. I know you've, you. you've raced across London <laughs> to be here. Sally has been head of diversity and inclusion at the Law Society since August 2020. She leads a team whose focus is on furthering diversity, inclusion and social mobility in the solicitor's profession. Sally worked previously as head of equality, inclusion and culture at the British Medical Association. And prior to that, spent 10 years leading work on equality and employment rights policy at the Trades Union Congress. She was formerly a joint chair of the charity Working Families and a trustee of Equally Ours, formerly the Equality and Diversity Forum. 
another brilliantly qualified, amazing person to have come here today. And we're up against the clock, but we're going to keep going. If you do need to go at six online or, or offline, please feel free to, but we're going to keep going for a few minutes. So, um, Sally, my question for you, please. Um, now, the Law Society, <laughs> it's my 25th year in the legal industry, right? the Law Society says with a smile, as the professional membership body for all solicitors, um, how does it view progress on gender equality and profession? So um, clearly there has been progress. Um, and, you know, in I think in 2017, which I think was the year that that letter was written that um, Manjari referred to earlier, that was the first year that you had more women um, in the profession than men, outnumbering um, those, en those entering at that time. Um, women are very attracted to law. We see in the en new entrants uh, joining the role last year, nearly two thirds were women. Two thirds of law graduates are women. But we have this really stubborn uh, issue of there isn't equality. There's, we're still some way off um, equity for women in law. Um, it, it's already been said by others here that there, there's a big problem um, in terms of retention and in terms of progression. Um, last year, we did a piece of work looking at the progress that's been made over the past four years, the first four years of gender pay gap reporting. One thing I would say is, um, echoing what, what's already been said as well, that there is it's clearly on the agenda now. It's on the agenda because clients have put it there. It's on the agenda because there's, there's a, you know, women who have been in the law for some time now and are frustrated at, at the rate of progress. Um, but we did a piece of work looking at gender pay gap reporting, and we saw that in those first four years, the gender pay gap within law firms, and this isn't including partners, and um, this is the figures reported to government, um, the, the gender pay gap is on average twice the national average in those largest law firms at 20%. Over the four years of gender pay gap reporting, where I've heard from law firms, it's really put it on that, that senior level agenda and people are beginning to talk about it more and saying, what are we doing? But it's only narrowed by 1.4 percentage points on average across the firm. And a rough calculation, very unscientific calculation, but you think that's another whole... <laughs> working life for women to get to equality at, at the current rate of progress. So um, I think it, it is increasingly being talked about. There are a lot of really good initiatives that are having some impact, but they have been quite individual focused, I think. Um, and some of the client pressure is very focused on the numbers. Um, but on the other hand, I think clients are still making demands of law firms that aren't particularly helping matters in changing yeah. the ways people work and what's required of, of particularly commercial lawyers. So there's a big way to go, but I think everybody is keen to talk about it. And I'd echo one more thing quickly that, that Bola said as well, is um, since I've joined the Law Society, I haven't spoken to a senior person who hasn't recognised the importance of diversity and inclusion. But when you start having the conversation, sometimes that that reveals things I think we need to talk about up front about what we mean by equality, diversity and inclusion. And quite often I've had the moments where very supportive of diversity and then there's almost an additional. But we still need to appoint on merit, like somehow there's going to be a compromise made that they, they don't want to see happening. Um, and I think we, we've got to tackle this issue of what does merit mean? Um, you know, all of the evidence that, that Manjari's referred to earlier shows that, you know, good performance in complex knowledge-based environments comes from having diversity. It's integral to merit and, and Thank top you, performance. Sally. And on that note, I'd like to introduce our, call that, our, our fourth panellist. Um, who can hopefully answer some practical uh, support to you companies out there who want to attract a more diverse talent base. We're joined today by Joe, the founder of Diversity and Recruitment. Joe has over 20 years experience in the recruitment industry and Joe set up Diversity and Recruitment to give recruiters the insight, tools and confidence to attract diverse talent, recruit inclusively and confidently partner with their clients. 
Joe believes the recruitment industry has the opportunity to influence and lead real change. So Joe, on that note, what should all the companies out there who are listening today be looking for in their recruitment partner? Because from my experience and the work I'm doing, a lot of recruiters are still 100% blind, and don't get me on my soapbox on this one, to taking on women that, or they, um, women that they can take on on a flexible basis. Recruiters don't even entertain it. So what does the recruitment industry, so you might have a, 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 a company that's open to it, but their recruiters are actually blocking mm. it. So Joe, what should companies be looking for in their partner when they're looking to increase their DNI? Yes, yeah, so it's a big question. I think sometimes we, um, we underestimate the influence that our recruitment partners have on our ability to, to change and to attract underrepresented talent to our firms, to our businesses. Um, sometimes there's an assumption that the work is being doing by the recruitment industry. And through my experience, not enough work has been done. There's a big education piece. Um, we're investing a lot of resources, a lot of expertise, bringing in people into our firms and our organizations to enable us to build our employer value propositions, to make our own recruitment processes fully inclusive and equitable and accessible, to do whatever we can as firms to attract talent into our organizations. But perhaps we're missing the opportunity to hold our recruitment partners accountable for the role that they play in helping us achieve our objectives when it comes to hiring. So my advice would be, if you are working, if you're aligned with recruitment partners that are bringing in um, lawyers to your organization, do your due diligence, hold them accountable. Don't assume the work is being done. Sit down with them and ask them the question, what are you doing to attract female talent to our organization? What are you doing to make sure that your recruiters understand the basics of diversity and inclusion? What are you doing to make sure that your recruiters are not just going to their immediate talent pools, which is what they do a lot of the time. Don't forget, recruiters are up against time. Um, they, um, they bill only usually on placement. Um, so for me, it would be about making sure that they know their stuff, but you're also thinking about going down that retained route. So if you've identified a recruitment partner that is doing everything they can to mitigate bias, to make sure that the recruitment, the recruiters in their firm are actually representative, um, you can really struggle if you're an executive firm rocking up to a business where it's all male recruiters and you're trying to talk about attracting gender diversity. So we want to make sure that our recruitment partners act actually reflect the demographic that we're looking to attract to our businesses. So really figuring out what are you doing, asking the questions and not just taking it on that typical answer that you'd usually get. We don't discriminate, you know, it's a meritocracy, skills and experience are the only things that we assess on. You want a much deeper answer for them to really evidence what their strategy is. What are they doing to challenge the status quo? What are they doing to control unconscious bias? What are they doing to make sure that their priority is to attract women into your firm rather than just getting the fee through the door? Are they talking to female candidates about inclusive benefits, family building um, benefits, for example, flexible working? You know, all these things that sometimes we don't think about make a massive difference as to whether or not a woman decides to apply for a role, whether or not a woman will deselect themselves when they read the job description. So we, we really need this level of expertise to be able to help us make what we do more inclusive and, you know, just look for that additional support. Thanks, Joe. Um, okay. I, we're up against time and I said to you, I emailed the audience and said, we're gonna have loads of time for questions. We will, as long as you're right to stay. Um, <laughs> the first question that we had online was, and I might ask Bola and Andrew, one of you to pick this one up because you work for two big employers. 
was from Eleanor online saying, why is it so difficult for a three-day working pattern in law? Now, you, your, both your businesses advertise for two, three days. So this has been a bane in my career um, for people that we've you know, tried to get in, just friends who are women. But is it, is it still really hard for a three-day working pattern, Bo? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm assuming you wanted a bit more than yes. Um, <laughs> It is really difficult. So the first thing we have to remember is that the, 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 the modern workplace was really built in the 1950s, right? So it was built based on the assumption that only one person in a household was going out to work. And in many ways, we've just never really broken the shackles of that mentality, right? So that's, a, that's the first thing. Law then is, I think, very special. Interestingly, we're doing a project at the moment, which is really trying to understand what flexible working means. And so we're talking to people who work flexibly, understanding why, how they work, whether it works, what helps, what doesn't help, et cetera. And bizarrely, one of the things that we have found is that people say, three days doesn't quite work. It really depends on what level you are, but generally speaking, the more senior you get, the harder it is to work three. Four seems to work, but three, you really struggle. And some of it is, um, is due or perceived to be due to clients and client relationships and how those are managed. Um, I think it's also in, in my view, because obviously I've worked in financial services, we're flexible working. It's just something that's been done for about the last decade, uh, even in highly complex roles, in very, very senior roles, there's, flex there's part-time working, and you'll know this, there's part-time working, there's job sharing, there's all sorts, there's compressed hours, et cetera. For some reason in law, and it's, it's around, oh, well, you know, you need that particular kind of expertise, you know, the resourcing model, which is not something that we've talked about, the resourcing model within law actually in some ways will probably penalize you for part-time working because you might need to get another resource that will cost you and eat into your profits. So I do think that's something we haven't touched on, but chargeable hours, you know, law is based on inputs. Uh, you know, everything is measured on inputs. It's not measured on outcomes and outputs, um, which means that the way that you then price, you know, and the way that you look at profitability, resourcing matters. So, you know, why wouldn't you, why would you get two people to do compressed, not compressed, but um, a job share when actually you get one person and be more profitable in that piece of work? So, yeah, so it, it's really, I think it's really challenging. I don't know if you have anything else to add, Andrew. Um. I, well, I would agree with a lot of it. Uh, three days is difficult. I'm hoping that that's going to change because how we work is changing. Um, and we have the pandemic, awful as it was, some of the practices that came in, I think it has now become much more acceptable, hopefully, for women to work flexibly. And because there used to be a stigma attached to it, and I think that was difficult. What I'm really hoping now is because we have all had to embrace it, and that in its own way has been a great thing because men work flexibly now, we work in an agile way, um, that will continue. It's never going to go back. So maybe the whole stigma of three days, I completely agree with Bola. For whatever reason, matter-related hours or whatever, four days becomes easier than three days because on the other days you need someone to cover the work. But the other thing to mention is we have to bear in mind that clients who can be very demanding um, also have of families too. And they are sometimes a lot more understanding than we give them credit for. I think if you're honest about it and you tell them that, yes, you realize you're going to have to work very hard. Sometimes at a week, it's a weekend. Sometimes it's on an extra day, but they don't necessarily expect it all of the time. And I think the law firm that you are working with and, you know, hopefully the people here represent those, um, are good enough to say, no, they don't do that every week and they don't do that all the time. We work very hard, but it's not always about matter-related hours. And that's a really important culture to change. I, I was going to ask Mandri to come back up if you want and just stand as well. And Dana and Angelica, if you wanted to come back up are because any, we'll open it up to the audience. Yeah. Are there so, any questions from the audience? I have a lovely mic here. By all means, pick a pick of, not me, obviously, but pick one of the <laughs> qualified people to answer a question. Anybody have a question? Come on, let's have a question. You have one. I'll quickly come up with one. <laughs> <laughs> we have 
mic it for the Zoom. Sorry. I think it links to everything that's been said, which is about the fact that in the 1950s, one person went to the office and that person was a man. Um, we don't nearly enough language is really important here. We need to start talking about parenthood. We need to start have policies that are about joint and shared parental responsibility, because actually to change some of the things that we need to change, we can't do it as women. We need the men to help us. And I think one of the things that saddens me about this room at the moment is if this was the power structure of the world, look at the women in this room, look how few men are in this room. And I think it's about that we have to ensure when we are not in the room, who is holding that torchlight to have some of these conversations? Because I work in legal recruitment. I speak to senior partners in law firms all the time who are doing an extraordinary amount of work. And I think credit has to be given that law firms have moved hugely on this. But when that question isn't being asked, the invidious thing is it's forgotten. So I think we have to really ensure when we're having these conversations that we are having them because men have kids, men want to go home early. It's not just women that have these issues. So we need to really ensure that we are having really in those conversations that we're also not doing men a disservice because I'm sure a lot of them also do want to go home and put their kids to bed. So we really do need to ensure that in all of these conversations that we don't forget that as women, we need men to help us. I, I completely agree with that. And actually, just as an example, we have put in place a, a global family leave policy. And again, that is to redress the idea that it's not just women who take time off with children. Um, and what I've been amazed by, it's only come into play. And it was, um, you know, it is quite far thinking in its own way. But the number of men who are already signed up to take the time off, which is fabulous. So it is no longer about women just taking maternity leave. Men can have the right to, you know, go off for children, for adopted children, for um, for these reasons. And it has been embraced. And I think it's a very important thing to keep everyone on board and not to say this is just a female problem or this is, you know, it is about inclusivity for everybody. And I think if we go towards that, then we will hopefully take bigger steps. And as you say, the conversation has to keep going. Sorry, I need to hand over this microphone. I feel like I've Julia, we've got another question. We've got a question here for Sally. Anushka. Hi, hi, hi. Sally. Um, How did I know? The impression <laughs> I get is that everyone seems to be focused on the men in the city or in law firms. The people that I've come across that I've had most difficulty with have actually been women are women who are not interested in having families, but have issues with women who are having families. So I think teaching those in partnership needs to not just be targeted at men, but women also. I've had most of my obstacles have been with, or most of my issues have been with women who have not been supportive of me having had a family that's my biggest concern. Yes. Um, interestingly, when I was on maternity leave myself, one of um, one of my um, friends who I met when I was on maternity leave was dismissed because of pregnancy, um, because of uh, uh, her. She had two um, female bosses, one who didn't have children and one who said, you know, you've either got to choose or your husband's got to choose. And that's what happened in her instance. Her husband had given up um, his job to care for the children so she could progress the business. I think what we fundamentally need in this country is to change the way we view care and the way we value um, work, paid work and care. And I think uh, my sort of coming into DNI. 20 odd years ago, um, where lots of changes were being talked about, like the introduction of the right to request flexible working and better paid leave and everything. Um, we were viewing everyone, lots of that, what underpinned those changes was viewing everyone as a potential paid worker, a profitable worker. Um, and, and so we were trying to open up paid work to people. And I almost want to shift that so that we're now viewing, we should be viewing everyone more 
as potential carers and potentially needing care at some point in their life. And we, I think if we start from that perspective, that, that that's what we need from society, not just economic profit and value, then we might be able to, to shift the way, the way people view things. Um, sorry, that's maybe that's a bit philosophical. I'm just but... time. Joe, can I ask you a question? What are the three things that companies should do tomorrow to make more women apply for their, their job adverts they have on my site and they have on other sites as well? Good question. Um, I think don't shy away from talking around um, flexible working. Um, be really clear on, on the benefits. Um, if you're working with recruitment partners, make sure that the information that you're giving them is, is filtering through when it comes to the working environment and the culture. Absolutely. If you're doing some really, really fundamental things around gender equality within your firm, make sure that that isn't hidden somewhere. You know, put that on the advert. An advert is a piece of marketing. Um, that is absolutely critical. The basics, like making sure that the, you know, the, the language that you use isn't too heavily, you know, on the masculine side, making sure that you use a gender decoder, always including the salary, you know, big, big piece of, 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 of closing the gap is to make sure that every advert you put out there demonstrates the salary, displays the salary, um, minimizing bullet points, but yeah, just thinking about like, you know, writing your advert for somebody who's, who wants that flexibility that needs to know that your organization is a destination employer. Yeah. And I would add, and I say this with all loving respect, um, job adverts from law firms can be really quite dry and quite boring to read. <laughs> and then you worry why you're not attracting some really amazing talent. So I'd ask you to give them a bit of oomph they are human beings that you want to come and work for your firm and give them a bit of, just write them as if you're talking to somebody. They are so boring that you lose the will to live halfway through and then you have poor application rates. Um, but if I just have a quick, I think we're, we are running over. So I'm going to ask you all fabulous ladies, all of you, what is the one thing that the law, law firm should do today? And what is the one thing or women who want to pursue their careers working more flexibly should do today so that we close the gap and we, we retain and attract more women into the legal industry. Who wants to go first? You don't have to go in. Um, I, I think whoever you, wherever you are in the organization, call it out, call it out, call it out, call it in if you like that better, educate the offenders. Um, and just quickly, I'm going to take a moment and the, this came up, this male, female thing. We're actually fighting against a mindset. It's not that only men will have that mindset. Women have adopted it as a strategy for progression and, and continue to do so. So fight the mindset, call it out when you hear it um, and, and do this collectively. It's difficult to do it alone. It's the change isn't going to come with one person calling it out. So be collective, find a group, whatever that is. But yeah, that's it. Thank you. Sally? Um, I think we have to uh, change. I think I'd probably go to the, the resourcing, how, how we resource uh, things within law firms um, and how we design roles and jobs. Um, we still have this idea. We're absolutely wedded, and it's really hard to un, uh, unpack it. But we're really wedded to this five-day working week, which then inevitably isn't five days. It's more than that. But there, there's this full-time default, and we've approached the issue of flexibility as how to chop that up in a different way, rather than being a lot more creative um, and looking at the tasks that are there to deliver what people want and designing jobs in that way. Okay. Um, and I think for women and others, not being afraid to present different creative ideas about how you think a role could be done rather than going in thinking, I'm going to ask for a job share and try and find a job share partner to chop it up in a different mm -hmm. way. Thank you. Jane? I think from a, um, from a recruitment perspective, as a, as a candidate, making sure that you're um that you, you're not you're not covering what you need from that potential employer and being really open and honest in terms of what what you need from that employer to be able to 
you know, to be successful and to have that, you know, have that balance that you need. Um, and asking those questions, really getting that potential employer to, to evidence to you what it's going to be like to work for that firm. How are they going to be able to elevate you? How are they going to be get, able to guarantee that you're not going to face discrimination, face sexism, face unconscious bias, face that glass ceiling and that sticky floor? Thank you, Jane. Bola? Hang on. Um... So all of the all of the above, <laughs> uh, and <laughs> um, I think if you're if you're looking in if you're looking at your organisation, sorry, if you're trying to make change in your organisation, the my one thing is around really peeling away those layers. So I've spent eighteen months at OC peeling away the layers to really try to understand what's happening because every single the, the dynamic in every single organisation is going to be slightly different. And it's about taking the time to really understand what those blockers are within the organization and then challenge, challenge, challenge and keep challenging. Um, Because half the time they don't know they're doing it and they think they're being, you know, some people think they're being really nice. Um, And then if, if it's you and you're thinking about your own career progression, don't count yourself out. So I, I think, And we've all mentioned this, the will is there, the desire is there, the support is actually there as well. So if you feel as though the next two years, you know, I've got small kids, I can't do the partnership thing, I'm going to opt out, don't. Have the conversation and find a way because I bet there is a way. Yeah, Yeah. Um, just to add to that very quickly, um, it is the same thing. Challenge things all the time. Choose a firm where you know that the leadership is going to come from the top. If the board don't support it, if they are not behind it, then everyone's just paying lip service to it. So make sure that when someone challenges something that it's taken seriously and change happens and there are actually targets and accountability and everything else. And also from your own point of view, um, women are not wonderfully good at having self-belief and confidence. We all struggle with that at whatever level you're at. Um, So find people who are going to be there to support you and believe in yourself. Um, you're probably so much better than you actually believe you are. And I would add, as I walk across here, that um, the companies that advertise on two to three days are all after women and are all open to flexible working. And for the companies out there, I've already said, please make your adverts less boring. And (laughs) I can talk to you about that more. And for the women, just don't assume the answer is no. Ask. You have got to lean in. And you've got to ask and the companies you'll be fine are more willing and open than you believe you may think they are so dana what's the one thing that you would add speaking the microphone oh yeah. sorry <laughs> <laughs> so i would say i'd love to see the world stopping reinventing things you know like we've seen it all at obelisk basically if you as an organization don't know how to make it work what well, i can tell you i don't know the hundred ways where you can make it work for a lot of people and equally the same for the lawyers, whether they're men or women wanting flexibility, we've seen it all. We championed you before, and there is no reason not to ask. So I think I would love to see, if you like, less innovation. Can we stop inventing new things and just accept that we know how to do it? We need to commit to the change and just do it, as Nike would say. But hopefully they don't sue me. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm surrounded by lawyers. Um, I wasn't going to say anything, but it's been really brilliant to be here and hear this conversation. And, you know, sometimes I'm thinking about what would it have been like if I had gone into the legal profession. But one thing that struck for me personally, personally, is over the last few years, we know that change is really needed in so many different, you know, avenues of work. And in my profession, the only only thing that I've done is thought, okay, change needs to be happening, but what can I do? And the only thing I can control is me. The only thing I can control is how I present myself, how I believe in myself. And I've worked on actually saying to myself, I'm good at my job and I should be here. And I think that when I've gone into workplaces and I've done that, people are just like, oh. And sometimes I might not be the first choice, but that doesn't bother me now, I think. I've taken that, you've taken the pressure of me, but I'm going to come in and make you think I should have been first choice. Mm -hmm. And, and I've seen a change in the way people treat me or how they perceive me. And I've been myself more. And I have a very, a 
amazing friend who always says to me, stop apologizing for being you. And I think when we start doing that, we will flourish. And sometimes you can't change structures. You can't change people. You know, unconscious bias, we've talked about that, but it's right. Find people who will champion you. No one, not everyone in life is going to love you. Not everyone in life is going to give you that job, but there are people who will respect what you've done, respect the effort you've put in and respect your core belief. Never compromise. I feel so empowered when I never compromise. And that's what I say to other women. Do you let them do them and I'll do me. That's brilliant. Um, we have overrun and it's my duty to uh, thank you all for being here today. Um, I think we'll all agree we've had a very interesting and insightful conversation. And I couldn't have done today if I hadn't been for a man who is absolutely behind championing women, and that is Nigel Clark of Nexa. Up here, up here Nigel. He's an ab he, this guy is an absolute rock star, and he has been incredibly supportive of, of women in the law firm. And it's my turn to give his company a bit of a plug. Nexa is a collaborative platform for lawyers who want to work differently. They are very ambitious, have a very inclusive culture, and are building a great community of people. They support freelance lawyers and they also work with law firms. So um, they're a very good choice. Um, so we're gonna wrap up now. And I'm sorry for those who are here virtually, you can come and have a virtual drink with us. But for the people in the room, the drinks are out there. So thank you very much for coming. Bye-bye. <laughs>